So rocket simulation, part four, the big picture. So what's next? We have a lot of things coming up in the near future. Already it has come up, so to say, in, 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 in some ways. You have the Internet of Things in industry, uh, which is about knowing what we have in the factory. Big data, knowing what is going on, data mining about things. It could be, for example, continuous uh, streaming from uh, different kind of sensors and sensor fusion. Sensors could be vision systems or quality control uh, equipment and uh, quality assurance and uh, analyzing these kind of data for um, um, controlling different kind of workplaces and process processes in the factory in the right way to attain better quality or higher output. And then cyber-physical systems, which is about controlling things, processes, factories. Cyber-physical systems actually is about uh, connected embedded systems, uh, embedded controllers, um, which actually are used to control things, connect things, attaining data. And to be able to utilize this, we need simulation simulation to actually access hardware processes controlling the loop before the action or check out that things is going to work in the way that we are expecting it to do um, so in robotics this is actually what's happening today some movie clips from Atomatic and munich uh, last year and um, we have two armed robots coming up to provide tasks which are normally used by humans, collaborative robots like this one, or maybe be Yumi. And um, this one is related to ICAB, related to cognitive robotics, actually developing methods to learn software that learns by experience uh, in a similar way as uh, a baby or child does um, detect things by the eyes and grab some basic instincts lightweight robots that can be connected in a collaborative way to wheelchair and used by disabled people Flexible hands, like this one from Schunk. Um, maybe not really industrial today, but uh, for sure will be something for the future. And um, a robot that is able to detect by sensors the throwing ball and uh, calculate the uh, path and uh, grab it in a fraction of a second. This one is uh, from DLR in Munich. It's equipped with the stereo vision and uh, scanning sensors, force sensing devices and so forth. And uh, Two armed robots for um, academic research showing actually what uh, is a lesson to learn that things that is quite simple for humans to do is difficult for robots and the vice versa. So, why is simulation needed? I would say that the simple answer is that the world is more complex today. We have components that belong to subsystems and subsystems belong to systems and systems could be a car could be a jet fighter could be a submarine could be a building whatever and systems tends to be more complex than it has ever been before 
and the outcome of how different things work in the system gets more complex than it has ever been. And we have moved from in-house development within the company to cooperative development, to network-based developments in the in a quite complex um, chain of supply. Uh, and to get this working and really track down the bottlenecks also requires simulation. Uh, we have globalization with increased competition, so we have to strengthen our capabilities, our risk management, and the way we do things. We have to know more and reduce risk in the in the huge and complex projects and understand what we are doing. So simulation is actually also a communication tool when we work with different things, communicate with others within the project or for our customers. So, for example, just imagine that we have a change, we have a dramatic change and that has happened. Things get different when new technologies arise, like plug and produce of sensors, devices, makes it more affordable and, and, and uh, actually possible to use new technology in new ways. So our competitors do that, but we are not doing that. We have to be aware about what if that happens, what are we going to do? Application programming by using natural languages or augmented reality tools or whatever that actually takes down the programming time by a factor of 10. If we don't apply that, we are in trouble. Autonomous behavior for different work processes or just collision avoidance by automatic methods. We have this with safety, collaborative collaboration between human robots and lightweight materials, new materials in products or in um, production equipment, like could be like a, a, a fixture or a jig that the robot is actually um, able to uh, move around if it's more lightweight, but not if it is a heavyweight product. So things can change in, in a dramatic way. We have also more efficient power systems with electric and battery operated equipment. Uh, if that is possible, then everything changed, I would say. An efficient computer networking multiply actually what we can do within a controller. If we have a cloud-based backbone computer resource. Integrated products, configured products, uh, is a new way to combine the hardware and the software for product we are producing, but also the products within the production systems. And in a way, we will be able to, with automation and ro robots, compete with humans at any cost in a way. I mean, it really depends whether it's feasible or not, but if we combine all the resources we have with sensors, sensor fusions, collaboration, ro humans together with robots, and quality and output. I would say that in most cases, it doesn't matter if people work for free and automated solution, which take into account all these kind of affect, uh, aspects, will outcompete 100% manual work whatever. So how does simulation help you? We have this issue with digital modeling, computer-based um, software. The resolution of models is selectable, so actually we can zoom out and, uh, or in with the resolution. We can move in time and space and we can perform physical verification as needed, check out, calibrate things as needed to enhance the models. And complex systems can be simplified as needed to actually perform 
the validation and the analysis in the time allocated. So the importance of efficient workflow, some examples. Usually we want to have an answer as quick as possible. So a small system can quite easily be modeled and simulated in a short time. Short time means maybe not days, but say a week or a few months. That should be okay in most cases. But large systems require extensive modeling resources. You have, must have data input, personal time. So we need support from teams of experts in various areas. And several people have to develop the models and the simulations. And um, some reporting has to be over time. This is really a big problem. So there is a need for efficient communication and teamwork. So to the left, you have two developers, usually quite fine. Four developers, yeah, it would work if they work in a good way using good methodologies. But when it increases, more people need to communicate with, with each other. So I would say if we go above four, it will be a, a, a really huge problem. So increased complexity requires efficient communication channels in the development process to work. Otherwise, there will be no uh, developments over time. We have to modularize things and produce incremental useful results. Otherwise, it won't work. Um, and we have to select priorities, resources in different development stages. So, robot simulation and programming. The general workflow, I would say, is something like this. We have objects that are created or have to be created using computer-aided design tools. We have robot models, usually from robot vendors. We have peripheral equipment like end effectors, fences, jigs, fixtures, whatever, tools. Uh, some provided by vendors, some we have to actually do ourselves. So anyway, we build up a cave database and over time that will be quite uh, full, so to say, with data that we can use and populate our simulation model with. We build it up, place things as it should be, connect things as they should be connected, can calibrate to the real cell if that is existing with nominal data using some uh, calibration tools for that and do some initial simulation and programming and usually quite early we do uh, some simple tries verify calibrate test that things are working go back uh, and check up that okay now everything seems to be fine so we continue work with the simulation, provide some programming and uh, come to the more end of the whole uh, work, so to say, and then transfer download. Do some uh, verifying checks, um, some tuning, go back and uh, redo the simulation to the final step. And finally, we have a fully working simulation and program for the robots. So, looking at the geometric model, we need to look at the accuracy with respect to the relative placement of objects and shapes. There have to be an adequate resolution for the task. Not too many objects and not too few. And in principle, very heavy models or unpredictable collisions could arise. So, what does it mean? Well, it really depends. But in principle, in most cases, the step in the simulation should be in time, should be something about two hundredths of a second. That is quite normal, I would say. Uh, otherwise, it might step over and not detect a uh, collision with an object. And objects. Well, it, again, it really depends on the application. But uh, 
anything bigger than maybe five millimeter should be modeled in a normal industrial setting. If it's a very small items, of course, smaller objects have to be modeled. That is for sure, I mean. But uh, if you talk about the normal kind of uh, industrial robot applications for any kind of general purpose applications, like handling machining tools, uh, machine tending, whatever it is, five millimeter is quite normal. So some, just some examples how it can look like on the screen, different robot models. Um, if we build devices, we use different kinds of rotary joints or translational prismatic joints, uh, which could be applied for solo tracks, for end effector scrapers, for jigs, fixtures, whatever is really needed. And uh, in some cases, it depends how the simulation works. If it is a general purpose simulator that emulates and mimics a um, controller of any kind, usually we should use a realistic robot simulator to improve the accuracy of the simulation, especially if we are close to the full performance 100% utilization of the system of the final system that means that there is a um, controller that is more close to the real performance of the uh, uh, target system and that actually receives data from a simulation system what uh, is going to happen in the next tick so to say and then it sends back the next tick information about joint values and other data what is necessary to actually perform the simulation. If we use a simulation system that is native for the robot system, like Robot Studio, in uh, the case of ABB robots, then this is more or less included because the simulator works with a real controller software of the system and we get the full kind of accuracy of the simulator right away. So it really depends. And if we are not that concerned with the fuel, with accuracy, we can skip it for a time, but in the end it should be considered. Now things that actually then can be done, as I mentioned, collision checks. Uh, the system usually warns then if it is turned on, that uh, this is a collision or a possible collision and um, then I can do something about it. Translated to target systems. There is in general no robot standard language for different systems. Okay, the, there is of course uh, one language for the same kind of vendor like ABB, KUKA, Hano, Yaskawa and so forth. But between those there is no standard. So a general purpose robot simulator has to have a translator or different types of robots from different vendors. Otherwise, it won't work. And then usually we can work with two strategies, either work with the target language during programming and simulation directly or translate to the target language before downloading, meaning that work with an intermediate, in the middle, kind of generic software that is provided by the uh, robot simulation software, and then translates to the final target system as we want to have. And usually, robot languages are related to computer programming languages in general, but add on some extra data types and constructions also related to the equipment or the controller functionality like input outputs or, or, or managing sensors and so on. So there are some extras coming in uh, that we have to think about.
And as I mentioned, calibration has to be performed to increase accuracy. So models must agree with the real systems. And the three major areas to calibrate the tool, robot, objects. And if a robot is placed on a server track and operating uh, together with a positioner, those has to be calibrated as well. And uh, then they, they have to be connected uh, to world coordinate systems, I would say, with as high accuracy as possible. And then we ver verify and run. Check out that can generate programs in the manner that we expect with the tolerances that we can accept and then just execute and, and run in production programs. Update when needed. Usually updates should be taken up to the simulation model where the changes are made and then download a new program. And then we have documented programs that actually uh, can be managed in a proper way. Okay, bye.